Well, Kristen, it's a very full list, and the most uh, perilous thing for Democrats is that in the two weeks post-election since they first opened their door, they have not cleared a single uh, item off that plate. So let's tick through them quickly. There's the same-sex marriage bill, which did clear a procedural hurdle in the Senate recently. It's on a, a glide path to passage, but that could take all week in the Senate. Beyond that, they have until December 16th to strike a deal to fund the government. That uh, seemed, you know, that there was a lot of optimism surrounding that, but it's not clear if that optimism persists at this point. There is the possibility that it slips, and if it slips to next year, then the House Republicans are not going to tolerate anything like this kind of a deal. They're going to have to start from square one and potentially continue to run the government on autopilot. There is the NDAA, the uh, reauthorization of the Pentagon. Uh, again, unclear where that stands. There are a host of extraneous demands. There's some uh, uh, simmering controversy about Ukraine funding that could uh, gum this up. There is the Electoral Count Act bill, the legislation to prevent, you know, another January 6th to prevent stolen elections in the future. There's optimism about this. The clock is ticking, yes, but that bill has passed the House. A version of it has enough support to pass the Senate. They just have to find the time uh, to do it. And beyond that, I made a list here because there's uh, a lot. January 6th <laughs> committee has to issue its final report and legislative recommendations. They have uh, not closed the door to another hearing to roll out those legislative recommendations since they have to meet to adopt the report. Those are the items that they still hope to get done. Then there are the, the kind of wish list, maybe pie in the sky items. Democrats want to, some of them at least want to eliminate the threat of debt ceiling brinkmanship. That's going to be a very heavy lift because it'll require Republican support. There's some talk of an immigration deal and a DACA, you know, something to deal with the dreamers. They've been trying that for two decades. There's nothing I've seen that uh, indicates they can do this in the final few weeks of this year. And voting rights, as uh, Mr. Mr. Clyburn mentioned that is simply not going to happen. The best Democrats can hope for is a, a, a modest piece of legislation that deals not with voting rights, but uh, stealing elections. That has bipartisan support, Kristen. Well, Sahil, you laid out the menu very well. Very quickly before I go to Mike Memoli, uh, talk about how steep the road is for Kevin McCarthy to win the speaker's gavel. Obviously, there's going to be a vote in January. It's looking pretty rough at this moment, Kristen, and there's some deja vu for Kevin McCarthy. This is his third attempt here. He uh, was the heir apparent to become speaker in 2015, had to drop that bid because of a lack of support. He came just a few votes away from winning the House majority in 2020, in which he would have been a shoo-in uh, for speaker. He fell short of that, and now again, he's looking at a narrow majority. He's next in line to be speaker, but as you, as you point out, more than those four votes he will likely have to spare uh, in the Republican caucus have said they are going to uh, oppose him. The question is, how movable are those votes? We know that the far right of the House Republican caucus is willing to flex their muscle. They're willing to deal embarrassments to House Republican leadership on the floor of the chamber, and that is the battle that Kevin McCarthy is fighting. We see him leaning in uh, toward the right, you know, tilting right, trying to channel some of the uh, uh, grievances and some of the concerns of his right-wing members to try to win their votes. It's not clear, though, it, whether it'll be enough. Well, the White House will be watching all of this very closely. Mike Memoli, let me turn to you and talk about some of the priorities on the table for the White House, because uh, during his Thanksgiving break, in the wake of two more horrific mass shootings, President Biden again saying that he wants an assault weapons ban. Some of the new members of Congress are saying, look, put it up for a vote. Even though it doesn't seem like we have the votes, it's a priority. We want to move on this. We want to take a stand on this. But it seems awfully difficult to see that that's going to happen. Mike, what's the White House saying? Yeah, Kristen, Sahil did a great job of laying out the very crowded menu of mm -hmm. options ahead of Democrats in this lame duck session. And this a possibility that Chris Murphy, the senator from Connecticut, who's been such a leader on this issue of gun safety reforms, floated over the weekend that he thinks there is potentially 60 votes in the Senate for a version of an assault weapons ban. We have heard President Biden repeatedly in the closing months of the midterm campaign and even since then say that getting a new form of a ban on assault weapons is a high priority for him. He reminds us that he was able to pass that when he was a senator, chair of the Judiciary Committee, and is committed to doing that again. You can add that to the list, potentially, of want-to-dos in this lame duck session. And I'll add a couple other emergency, potentially, options that the White House is looking at. We've been talking about this possibility, Kristen, of a potential rail, rail strike, uh, strike mm -hmm. with uh, four of these uh, 12 labor unions that are involved uh, in the rail supply supply chain, as it were, uh, having voted down this compromise effort. There's increasingly talk both on the side of labor, on Capitol Hill, and even among some at the White House that the possibility of Congress acting legislatively to impose 
the compromise deal that President Biden heralded just a couple months ago is also potentially on the table. So the White House has been looking at what this lame duck session could look like. And knowing that the time is so scarce, I'll add one other variable, Kristen. They know that in a 50-50 Senate, and remember, we still are looking at a 50-50 Senate for the next few weeks, uh, depending on that outcome of Georgia, depends on what happens in the Georgia runoff. There's no business that they really think they can conduct until that runoff concludes next Tuesday. And so that constrains the timeline to get a lot of this work done even further. Yeah, Georgia on everyone's minds. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.